Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. On a day like this, but probably about 50 degrees warmer, Jesus came to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. The place was swarming with sinners, fallen, sorry, guilty human beings who had come in hope of John the baptizer <clears throat> cleaning up their lives and turning things around for them. The daily newspaper, the nightly news, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, all tell us what most of them had done. Passing bad checks, driving drunk, unarmed robbery or armed robbery, failure to pay child support, really bad dancing. Did I write that? Yeah, really bad dancing. And jokes, bad jokes. And commentary that hurt people and so much more. Some of them would have been known to you from their pictures if you still go to the post office. They're the ones on the board that appear there. Some of them were on the nightly news for Crime Stoppers. Some were hardened criminals looking for a shortcut to heaven's gate. Others were guilty of crimes of the heart, which only they and God knew about. But none of them lived in the illusions of innocence. They were all there because they knew they were covered in the dirt of their lives that they had dumped on themselves or that someone else had dumped on them. And they hurt and they were there and they had come to get cleaned up. Then this one guy shows up. He's completely different than all the rest. It's Jesus of Nazareth. He isn't famous yet. In Mark's gospel, there are no accounts of his birth or early childhood. Nothing tells us anything about him in advance. His life begins with this baptism. So no one clears the path for him. No one makes a way for him to get to the water. He takes a number and he waits in line. Later, after John baptizes him and the heavens have been torn apart and a voice from heaven makes it clear who he is, the Son of God! You better believe that the crowd looks at him differently. Who is this guy, the Son of God? Who and what is he doing here? John and the others want an answer to this question, right? What is this sinless dude from a place that nobody cares about called Nazareth doing in a seething sea of sin by the river's edge? To say it is uncomfortable is an understatement. A pure hearted saint in a sea of sinners. It gets edgy down by the riverside. The others begin to look at him. They look at each other differently. You see, I believe that the church has never, ever felt comfortable with Jesus' baptism. I believe we have so many issues related to his baptism because he was pure and he was innocent. He didn't need a baptism of repentance. He didn't need to clean up his act. He was the cleanest act in human history. Nevertheless, he made a choice with all of us who need to clean up our act in some way or another to come down into the water with us. He humbles himself to be with us, even though he's nothing like us on the inside. By doing this, he gives shape and form and meaning to his own name, Emmanuel, God with us. By wading into the water of the Jordan River, by receiving baptism in the arms and at the hands of John, Jesus adopts us as his family, his siblings, just as God has done through him on behalf of all creation. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I are connected with God and Christ throughout this time. Our adoptive connection comes through Christ's body and blood at communion and through the water and spirit at baptism. 
It is our TGNA, through grace, newly adopted. Not the DNA that makes us one in Christ. Because in Christ, we already know then who we are and whose we are. It is always important to remember that all of us, every single one of us is adopted. And I gotta tell you, anyone who's listened to me talk about this through the years knows I'm passionate about this. I get so sick and tired when people separate their children by this one was birthed and this one was adopted. I fall into that trap myself at times. But we are all adopted. And that's how God receives us and loves us and knows us as the adopted ones into this faith family. Every single one of us. Not one of us has a bloodline. Not one of us has a pedigree. We are all here by the grace of God alone. That's it. Our job is simple, really. We have made some resolutions and promises in baptism. We are called to live into the promises and resolutions we've made. We are called to confess, to step to the waters of grace, to get wet, to be different, at least for a while, certainly at least more than just a few seconds. We are called by God to live into the promise of baptism with the audacity of hope and faith. We are called by God to renounce evil and accept new life in Christ. God calls us to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We are called to live a good life, a life that's exemplified by our faith in Christ. And this includes deepening our knowledge and experience of Christian faith, serving the world in God's spirit, doing justice and loving others more fully. It's all there in our baptismal vows. It includes instructing our children and grandchildren to do the same so that one day they may live fully into their vows or vows that were made on their behalf. These are the promises made. We've made them. All of us are witnesses to one another's promises and all of us participate in the promises too. All of us are called to the water, especially knowing that not one of us is perfect not one of us has figured everything out. All of us are TGNA, through grace, newly adopted. My friends, baptism is never really about watching. You just experienced that, right? You were watching and singing the hymn and you got wet, right? <laughs> baptism is always an interactive thing. It's about wading in. It's not done on the sidelines. It's not done in a corner, it's done in the center of the field, in the heart of the sanctuary, in the heart of our faith community together. It's done because we are not a spectator sport. We don't just sing Alleluia and put it aside. It's at the center of who we are. Our perfect singing and harmonizing are beautiful. But that's just how the story begins. That's where the promises get made. When our children ask us the meaning of something related to Jesus Christ, we need to be able to answer for ourselves to them. We need to give our answers. We don't need to say, wait, I'm gonna Google it. I'll be right back with you, hang on. Um, well, someone in Australia says that this is what it means. They wanna know what it means for you. They wanna know what it means for you. So baptism is always about water and spirit which is why moving from Mark to Acts seems like such a weird thing, like moving from the grace and glory of God to bizarro world. That's right, the beautiful conversion to grace in Mark turns into a very strange conversation right away in Acts 19. It's bizarre, it's really bizarre. Have you ever entered a room, please don't say it was today, but have you ever entered a room and everything feels really bizarre? I mean, really strange. That's how Paul, might be a party. Might, might be some place that you've gone, it's like, uh-oh. That's how Paul must have felt in this story today. It must go something like this. You've got into a room, you sit down, you're paying attention, you're listening to what folks are saying, and none of it speaks to you at all. None of it makes sense in your life experience, in your field of work, in your discipline, in your understanding of practices and protocols. As a scientist or med medical professional, you're there and you hear a colleague say, oh, we don't follow rigorous scientific protocols around here anymore because we don't need to pay attention to the tests. They're just, that's, we don't care about results. 
because that's what they used to do in the old days. We don't do that anymore. Details don't matter. Go, what? <laughs> As an artist, you hear another artist say, well, the new art that we're going to do is just going to be done with water and not with colors because water makes everything more clear. And you go, what? As a teacher, you step into a room and you hear one of the other teachers in the teacher's lounge say, yeah, I spank the kids the minute they leave their seats because how else are they going to learn not to leave their seats? And you go, what? As a student, you go into a conversation with your friends and, and one of the others says, you know, it's okay to curse and call names in our classroom because Mr. I used Jones and Smith at the first service and there were Joneses and Smiths there. So Mr. Fill in the blank, Edison, just doesn't care or say anything. And you go, what? These are jaw-dropping moments. No idea how anyone or anybody can say these things about others, right? It's completely out of order. It's just stinking thinking. You are now in bizarro world. Joining Paul. I feel like there's something that's happening in Acts that's just like this. It seems like baptism is a water-splashing free-for-all. Paul gets to town in Ephesus and meets with the Christians there who were there before him, and he finds they've all been wrongly baptized, right? They had no idea there was a Holy Spirit. Did you catch that part? It's a rather important part of this passage. They'd never heard of the Holy Spirit, but Paul handles it beautifully. He says in Bizarro World, not you are wrong or you, you should be ashamed of yourselves. He does not berate anyone. He doesn't chide them. He asks questions. He discovers that they really don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. So he teaches them about the power of the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit works through baptism. Right? He shows them that the Holy Spirit directs all of the mission, all of the worship of the church. He says that everything we do to this day, by the way, is done by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. Our preaching, our prophetic work, it's all in the name of Jesus Christ, directed by the Spirit. He takes them out of bizarro world and delivers them into the world of Jesus Christ all of them now directed by the Holy Spirit. Paul keeps it simple, and then he invites them to receive the Spirit, and they do, problem solved. So, when we are faced with bizarro world comments in our lives that make no sense in science or medicine or art or education or discipline and direction in anything, we can change the conversation to conversion. Spirituality and discipline embrace and all can be well. There's a lesson in this for us. When we feel or see something we find strange and disruptive to the Spirit of God, we work it through with gentleness and with trust. Paul says it better than anyone in Romans 8, 28. He says, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to God's purposes. So, let us turn from the font to the table, once again. As we come, not because we may, but because, not, but not because we must, but because we may. As we come, not with all of the answers to our many questions of faith, but we come with our questions, knowing that God receives us here gently and welcomes us here lovingly. Let us come, not because we are perfect. Because I don't know about you, but I think I can say pretty honestly, I'm not and none of us are. But instead we come knowing that our God receives us in love through grace newly adopted, T-G-N-A. Amen.